Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for packing the room so full. It's great to see. Um, it's my absolute pleasure today uh, to be hosting Robin Johnson. So Robin's actually uh, one of the people who originally uh, helped set up Cornwall Science Community as well, um, and is therefore a veteran of Cafe Sci Talks from the other end anyway. Uh, so it's great to have him talk about uh, his work today as well. Um, so Robin's got a background in um, social care and more recently has um, set up a platform connecting people that address psychological and emotional and complex issues, including uh, homelessness. Uh, but today he's going to be telling us all about biosemiotics. So uh, the way this works, I should mention, um, we've got a couple of participants online as well, hence the microphone here and there. Um, and we'll be putting this onto our YouTube channel afterwards as well, just so you're aware we are recording it. If for the Q&A afterwards you'd rather not be on microphone or anything, just let me know. Uh, there's absolutely no pressure and we can cut that out before it goes into YouTube. Um, other than that, um, Robin was going to give us a presentation first uh, with a lot of ends that you can maybe uh, think about if you want to dwell into something during the Q&A afterwards. Um, so we'll have a short presentation followed by an extended Q&A where I'll try and moderate it slightly and go back and forth throughout the room so that things can get picked up in this microphone as well. Um, great, without further ado then, I'll open the floor to Robin. Okay, thank you, David. Short presentation, at least I hope it will be a short presentation. Um, this subject I want to talk about is dauntingly huge. And I am not, you know, often we say that a cafe side talk, you have an expert on a subject who will talk for 20 minutes, that's our intended target, and then you have an extended question and answer session afterwards. Um, I am not an expert on this subject, or at least only the bits of where I kind of can see the implications in my particular field, which was psychiatry, community, mental health, and so on. I see in this something which is, I think, really quite useful for us, those of us who work in welfare, well-being, kind of the, the people industries. Um, <clears throat> but I actually only came across the two central concepts that I'm going to be talking about less than a year ago. Just a chance mention in a book that I was reading about language in plant realms, in the plant kingdom, should we say. And I found reference to something called the Umwelt. And I thought, this is interesting. Obviously, it must have been in the context. Looked it up, and it was a rabbit hole. I went down and I found out more and more and more about two key concepts. In both of these, I'm a newbie. So I want to share with you the kind of excitement that I found coming across this stuff, thinking this is absolutely amazing. But there's no way that I'm giving you the definitive story about what this is about. This is not, this is the beginnings, I hope, of a conversation in which we can discuss what these ideas mean for us all, both scientists and non-scientists. It's not the last word by a long way. And in the Q&A, we can tease out some parts of it because as I say, it's huge. Incidentally, this rather enigmatic image that I chose for the, for the website, um, they, sometimes the only way you can join up, I was gonna say join up the dots, but they're crosses. Sometimes the only way you can join up the dots of fragments of different thinking that don't somehow come together is by stepping outside of the frame of reference. It's a well-known party trick, isn't it? That, that. So the image here is sometimes to join the things up, you have to step outside of the way you were thinking before. And that's what happened to me, really, in coming across these two new concepts. Next slide. Right. This is how much I'm going to try and get through, which is a ridiculous amount. There's no way I'm going to do this. So the, 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 the beauty of a cafe side talk is that sometimes you just throw out a mention that there just isn't time to go into in detail in the hopes that in the Q&A, people say, what were you going to say about that if you'd had time to actually say it? So if there's anything in here that has you thinking, oh, well, well, we'll come back from that. I'll, you, I'll dip in and out of this at, at times anyway. But biosemiotics, the lead title for the, for the talk, um, the Umwelt, a concept that was completely new to me and which is really extraordinarily interesting. Um, the character, Jakob von Uxkuhl, who first came up with this new way of thinking about biology and about life, some of the experiments he did, a little side shoot here with some of the resonance that this thinking has for more contemporary um, 
contemporary approaches to animal life and, and life on this planet. Um, the central issues of experience and engagement that he was talking about. I'll explain this as we come along. And then a complete leap, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, Immanuel Kant from 18, whatever it was, and Copernicus. How does this get worked here? How big is this subject going to be? It's all about decentering. It's all about removing our fundamental framework of perception from the human to seeing a bigger picture. And that's what Kant and Copernicus did, as we'll see in a bit. At which point, uh, what about us? What does this mean for us? And I was, as David says, I was a psychiatric social worker. My field is our world, the human world, the human social world. So how does human biology fit into this new thinking about life? Well, I'm going to take a sidetrack to what I think is a, a dead end. DNA and sociobiology, side swipes at that. And then moving on to neuroplasticity, this exciting buzzword of the last 20 years or so, which suggests that we are much more, uh, our, our worlds are much more flexible and responsive and so on. Epigenetics I could have used there alternatively. The role of culture, a particular sociological theory or framework called symbolic interaction, or symbolic interactionism. In, in the full total, and that's one part of where social science is going. And that then might, if I get there, lead us to talking about where some of this is in terms of social policy, social action, and the human world in which we operate. And by then, already through about three minutes, I would guess, of my, of my total 10. So let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna, for this talk, suggest that there are two different ways of seeing some, something afresh, seeing something anew. The first of those is what you might call a new paradigm. I mean, it's a well-used well word, isn't it? You know, new paradigms for everything under the sun. But this is so big, I think you can really genuinely call this a new paradigm. And the other is a completely different perspective, a new vision, effectively. This is a new vision of our own planet, Earth, our home, and by implication, life and our lives in it. The difference between, as I'm going to suggest, a paradigm and a, and a vision is that a paradigm teases the intellect. It gets you thinking differently. It puts our ideas together in different ways that is stimulating and challenging and fruitful and so on. But there's something about a new vision that is emotionally engaging. You know that word engagement I said I'd come back to? As I see it, a new vision of what life is about we relate to it has meaning for us and meaning is an essential part of life as we'll see so next slide sure enough biosemiotics that long long word um, is the new framework and for those who know anything about semiotics please tell me what the hell it means because i'm really struggling to understand i've heard the term over a number of years and it's only in this context it's beginning to mean something to me. The bio bit, I think we can all relate to and get. But this is the concept, the Umwelt. Uh, next slide, I think. The Umwelt, a German word, um meaning around, Welt meaning world. So the Umwelt is the world around us. In most uses, if you go on to, you know, YouTube or Internet anywhere and just you know, Google for Umwelt, you'll get lots of stuff about ecology because it's the word in German for the environment. And so, of course, most concerns about the environment are about what we are doing to the planet. But here, there's a com completely different meaning of the word. Well, let's go to the next slide. This is the world as we see it, the environment you might say. What we're going to look at instead is a very, very different use of the same word, which could be confusing, but it works for this guy. Jakob von Upskul. Next. This is a sketch of him. This is him looking, looking kind of a bit worried, I, I think. In here. This is him in his laboratory. Von Upskul, towards the end of the 19th century, Yes, yes. And the first uh, two, three decades of the 20th century, Upskill 
was doing experiments on animals, but very different from the kind of animal experiments that we're used to, where people prod and poke and do horrible things and you know cut out bits of the brain or the eyes or, or whatever. What Uxkill was interested in was how the animals themselves experience the world. So what's the animal thinking about this experiment you're doing? You don't get that if you're starting to sort of cut about and, and so on. Um, so he has a perspective on life and biology and experiments, experiment, experiments, which is treating creatures as subjects, as sentient, and as experiencing the world. And what he wanted to study was how, what do they experience? How do they experience the world, which is different from the way that we do? And we'll look at some of his experiments in a moment, but I'm just mentioning him because that, that gives you some idea. It is the world as, it is, it is life seen from a subjective experiential point of view as, an, as a subjective experiential phenomenon, as against seeing it from the outside to look at some muscle and bone and, and, and so on. It's how do we experience the world? And when I say life, as we'll see later, this goes back to viruses and bacteria. This is not about human consciousness, nor is it just about animals and mammals. This is fundamental to all life. Let's now go on to biosemiotics, because having set up that sense of the emotional relationship, oh God, is that all we've done? Biosemiotics, this is taken from Wikipedia. I've done my research, right? I found a Wikipedia. From the Greek bios, life and observance of, we'll come back to that. If a field of semiotics, and like I say, that didn't tell me anything much, and biology, well, they are mongrel well, but studies the pre-linguistic, meaning-making biological interpretation processes, production of signs and codes and communication processes in the biological realm. It's really only the in the biological realm that I understood. You know, the more I read about it, the more I read that actually that is exactly what biosemiotics is about. But that's the, no. It integrates the findings of biology and semiotics. Well, biology and semiotics, okay. Um, and proposes a paradigmatic shift in the scientific view of life, the whole, so it's not just me that thinks this is me. The, the ambition here that I've only just come across and find exciting is for something as big as a shift in the scientific view of life in which semiosis, the, the, the meaning and the, 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 are imminent and intrinsic features in all life. That is a huge claim. That is a really, really seriously big claim. And I would encourage anybody who finds this at all interesting not to base what you hear next on what I'm saying about it, but to, but to look it up and follow your own rabbit holes to, to find out more about it. What I'm trying to convey is what an exciting idea this is, in particular when it's combined with that issue of subjectivity and engagement in, in an interactive view of life, the umwelt part, brings the two together. I've described them as one is a paradigm and one is a new perspective, but to be honest, it's more like a media strip. They are both so interrelated with each other. Von Utskill himself, in the early years of the 20th century, had, did not have the word biosemiotics. That's a much later thing. The biosemioticians knew about Utskill's words, so they use Utskill he didn't actually use, use that word. Insights from biosemiotics have also been adopted in the humanities and social sciences. Yes, good, at love. There are people besides myself looking at how this works in the, in the social sciences. The humanities bit, anybody working in the humanities, you're gonna to have to do that for yourself. We can look at it in the Q&A a little bit, but you know as much about this as I do. Including human animal studies, human plant studies, and whatever that's cyber semiotics. I think that's Norbert Wiener, but I'm not entirely sure. Human animal studies. One of the things that Skill uh, took a lot of interest on him was um, guide dogs for the blind, which if you think about it, is really interesting. 
the human brain and the dog's eyes are working in a symbiotic relationship. The brain of one, the eyes of the other. So he was very interested in, in how we make meaning in the world with the blind person helping to make meaning through the dog's eyes. Breaking out of that kind of human perspective of stuff. Let's go on to the next slide, otherwise we'll never get through it at all. Um, this is from the journal, the Biosemiotics Journal. I think it's called the International Journal of Bios Biosemiotics. Dedicated to building a bridge between biology, philosophy, linguistics, and the communication sciences. Uh, let's skip the rest of it, because we can come back to that another time. So here we have, in visual form, the new perspective, the new paradigm, and a few examples of human social life. I could have used uh, any forms of life, but my interest is in how what this new perspective can help us see in human social life. So that's why that's where I'm trying to go. And I'm already on 10 minutes, probably 11 by now. Right, okay. So the clue, as you will have guessed, is communication sciences. And communication in the human world is how we talk together about stuff. Let's go on to the next one. I've already mentioned Von Ixkill. He was actually, as the Von gives away, he was an aristocrat. Let's skip that bit because we can come back to that later because that actually is quite significant for one of the reasons why he's been eclipsed in the second half of the 20th century. So if that's tantalizing, you can always ask me about it later. Next slide. Here he is. Oh, sorry, that one. Here he is in what I would regard as his natural environment. He was an aristocrat. He had lands in Estonia. And in the Russian Revolution, lost all of his lands. So that's actually quite a significant part of his life world. And here he is more naturally in his own environment, which is the laboratory. Next slide. An example of some of the experiments we did. Snail on a wheel. Now, I wish I knew exactly what this was about, but the only descriptions I can find of exactly what he was studying are all in German. Much of his biggest life works have not yet been translated into English. Or at least they hadn't about five years ago when the person who wrote that, which I read, it was, it was true five or six years ago. This is really, really new stuff. It's a bit like My Light Shines, you know, that party game where some people get, ah, oh, that's what it's about. Um, that's what I would hope to give to you. Um, here is a snail. As it walks on its wheel, rather than getting anywhere, it turns the wheel, which would be really frustrating for the, for the snail. That is, I believe, a piece of lettuce or something else that the snail is attracted towards. And one of the things he was looking at was the snail's sense of time. How recent does the stimulus have to be for the snail to keep plodding towards this holy grail of, le of, of lettuce? If it's been more than, say, 10 minutes, or three minutes, or two minutes, or 30 seconds, at what point is the snail going to give? This is an experiment. No animals are harmed. The snail might have got a bit frustrated, perhaps, but no animals were harmed in this kind of experimentation. What he's studying as he brings the lettuce nearer and nearer and then further away is what motivates the snail. At what point does snail go, oh, right, I'm off, I'm, I want some of that. So he's studying the spatio-temporal world of a creature whose world we cannot understand, we can't relate to, there is an oh, there are all kinds of sort of kiddies books in which we have snails talking to each other and so on. This is not anthropomorphizing. This is trying to understand the senses that this particular life form is equipped with. This is a jellyfish. This is, in Uxkill's terms, the simplest of creatures. There's apparently only one muscular movement. I don't know if muscle is the right word. Bench. When the jellyfish goes it goes up because it's, and also sucks in food. And there's only two things that a jellyfish needs to do, clench or unclench. It's, got, it's a cybernetically very, very, very simple world. 
but even that he can look at and draw insights from. And those are just two examples. There's loads of other stuff he did as well, which I won't get into. Next slide. Uh, the unveilt of each creature, each creature has its own intrinsic to their nature, to their sensory abilities and so on, has its own nature, which is experiential and phenomenologically subjective. If anybody's come across the, the philosophy of phenomenology, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, let's just move on to the next slide. Uh, it is for mine so different from ours, but anthropomorphically trying to imagine what they're like. Never mind what's it like being a bat, as one of the philosophers has recently argued, we cannot understand the bat. What Fitzkill is suggesting is if we look at the sensory system, we can at least get insights on what their world is. And we'll come back to that in a while. The point is though, from the Uxkill point of view, that the snail is engaged. The snail is living its best life. It is interacting with the world. It's not just passively observing the world on the outside. The world is out there, subjectivity is in here. No, no, the snail is actually moving, doing things, and the world it perceives changes according to what it does. It's not just experiential, it's not just subjective, but it's interactive, and the world, it, the snail is an agent helping, interacting with and helping to create its own experience, at least to modify it. This is a really quite different kind of perspective. It shows engagement, not just as a sort of form of movement, but as something that is creative. And that's the kind of creativity we'll find in the humanities and in the social sciences. Just quickly, next slide. There's some brilliant talks on this by a guy called Ed Yong on YouTube, The Hidden Sensory World of Animals. He goes into this in quite a lot of depth. That's eight minutes long. Next slide. Uh -huh. Uh, this one is, I think, yes, 44 minutes. This is a Royal Institution lecture. And again, he goes into much greater depth, but he name checks Utskul. He doesn't use biosemiotics. He obviously thinks that's going to scare his audience off. Ah, next slide. Um, he's wrote, he wrote a book uh, called um, An Immense World. I first came across this guy when, when his book was serialized on Radio 4. You know, that 9.45 slot every, every morning. It was absolutely brilliant. You had him or somebody else reading the book, but also whenever there were sounds that indicated a different life world, there was a buzz of a fly coming in and out. And he points out that the speed of a fly's interactions with the world, they move so fast. You try and spot a fly, but it's moving fast. Its world, its spatio-temporal world, is so much faster than ours. Go to a sequoia redwood, they're also sensing the world. They're feeling the seasons, they're feeling the, the heat, drawing up water from the earth, but on a time scale again, so different from ours. But this is part of stepping out of the human perspective to that much bigger perspective. Very, very interesting. Some of you will have seen Peter Godfrey's book, look, Peter Godfrey Smith's book on other minds. It was a bestseller that was on, on sale in the, um, in the bookshop. Uh, he, he takes exactly the same observation about single cell creatures communicating with each other even before they join, join up, but never mentions biosemiotics, never mentions umwelt at all. He's got exactly the same kind of really vivid, engaged view of life, but presumably hasn't heard of this stuff. It's not even in the references. It's not that he thought it's too complicated, I won't mention it. He could have done. So this is still something that a lot of people are only just discovering. Next slide. Um, echolocation. Uh, a, um, in our time, if you want to get a, a, some discussions on a completely different sense that we can at least understand and study, echolocation in bats is a really good example of it. This guy here, Ben Jordan, has also got some interesting stuff looking again about our own senses. There's a lot of stuff on the internet uh, around this. Surprise, surprise. Um, and incidentally, next week, I heard today, next week's In Our Time is going to be discussing panpsychism. The idea that all life, the universe and everything has something like consciousness in it. That's not 
what biosemiotics and Uskul are talking about. They're talking about life. Inanimate life does not do the things that biosemiotics is talking about. So I'm going to listen to that in our time program, but I'm going to be seeing it from a different perspective, saying, yeah, but how much of that is actually about life rather than about plants and stones and so on, because they don't have purposes, they don't have meaningful interactions with the world around them. And that's what life is all about. Life is about meaning and about purpose. So for theologists, as well as other communication sciences, there's something really quite interesting here. That idea that the universe is cold and lifeless and, and so on. This is a different perspective on does life have meaning? Trouble is, it has many, 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 many meanings, not one big one. There's no God-given meaning. Every creature is making its own. And when it comes to humanity, it gets even more interesting. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay. Uh, no, let's miss that. Uh, just stressing in the communication sciences, which we've done before. Again, implications for philosophy. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, Uxkill himself saw himself as continuing and completing the work of Immanuel Kant. I did say earlier on that we've, we've philosophers here. And let's leave that for the Q&A. <laughs> Kant himself saw himself as continuing Copernicus's world um, work in no longer seeing the earth not just seeing humanity and reason, but no longer seeing the earth as central to the universe. So Kant, in seeing uh, perception as being a limited, oh no, I'll, I'll, we'll do that a bit later. Ne next slide. So I'm gonna really rush through, through this now. So what about us? How do we get from that to a new view of human life? Now you've got a much bigger picture now you know who you are, who do you want to be, as John Lennon once went through. Um, how do we get that from human social life and social policy? Next slide. That's how do we knit all this together. Next slide. You've seen this one before. This is the idea that we are evolved creatures. We are actually humans. We, we're, sorry, we're actually animals. Shall I give me a couple of minutes more? And I'll really rush through this. Five minutes. Five? Five whole minutes? Okay. I, I can do a lot with five minutes. Um, right, next slide. The first thing I want to look at is something that I regard as being a dead end. Now, I work a lot with psychologists, and many of them are wedded to evolutionary psychology. It was, it was one of the big ideas over the last 20, 30 years. So if I say, if I associate it with sociobiology even, but obviously I'm not the only one to do that. Uh, some of my close colleagues who I love dearly will be getting uncomfortable going, oh, well, this, is, this is really important. We, love, we think this is really exciting stuff. Um, before we go to the next slide, obviously, here's your somewhat ape-like guy with a club dragging the woman by the hair. As an image of sociobiology, it is a cartoon, obviously. It's an exaggeration, but what they're getting at, I think, is actually quite quite truthful on this side, because so much of sociobiology found, wanted to argue that aggression was built in to humans as, you know, as whatever it is, how they're built into a car. This is actually from the film 2001. Some people, people my age will recognize this at all. And those of you who have seen Barbie may or may not recognize the, the satirical pastiche on that in the beginning of that. It's a hilarious film. Um, but the Robert Ardery, who was one of the, origin the, the originators of the sociobiological perspective, um, argued that territoriality and aggression were fundamental to human nature. It's, this is us. This is what we are like. Suck it up. Deal with it. We are aggressive, we are barbaric, we are all those kind, kinds of things. And all this kind of compassionate, you know, sharing and cooperation, all that sort of namby-pamby liberal stuff, which is for people who couldn't face the real truth. Next slide. Um, even altruism. No, no, no. Competition is everything. This is a kind of the extreme version. The, what's sometimes called the, the neo-Darwinist perspective. 
the only form of altruism, the only form of cooperation you get is kin selection. You look after your own, you look after your children or the children or your uncles or aunts' children because they had the same genes as you. Com um, collaboration and, and cooperation is anathema in this nature red and tooth and claw. And the idea, next slide, uh, is of course extremely male. Next slide. You do every now and again get a version of human evolution which shows the evolution of woman, the ascent of woman. It's so hard to find these, these, these slides on the internet, because this is you know, the standard image that comes up is that male view. Um, next slide. And of course, it goes back to DNA. One of the reasons von Utzko's thinking, here's another one, one of the reasons Utzko's thinking got eclipsed I think in the second half of the 20th century, because suddenly we had a much more mechanistic interpretation of life, evolution, the where we are at in the universe. These two, you'll know Watson and Crick, he really does look like Jeff Goldblum. Next slide. And do you want to wrap up here? Or Sorry? Do you want to wrap up here or when do you want to move to the um, No, let me, let me just rush through a couple more things. Um, next, next slide. The, the fundamental fallacy here is the belief that humans did not evolve beyond the savannah plain because anatomically modern humans arrive on the savannah plains looking, their skeletons look like us. Next slide. Their brains, their heads, sorry, their heads look like us. But next slide. What we now know from studies of epigenetics and particularly the growth of interest in neuroplasticity is that actually within the human brain, there is change, there is development, and this is passed on to future generations, built on, developed, and so on. And that's slide 36 out of the 63 that I had <laughs> prepared. So, Hopefully, if you are interested in the implications for human life and pursuing what this might mean for social science and how that might relate to contemporary social policy, I throw that in with you to pick up later. But that so far is an introduction to biosemiotics, the Umwelt, the reason why this is opening up a whole new different way of seeing life, including our life. And you see why I just thought this was so exciting that after a beer with David in the, in the front a few months or so ago, I was willing to be talked into giving a talk on it, even though I am just at the beginning of exploring what this extraordinary idea means for us. Thank you very much, Robin. Certainly a very broad topic, a lot to go into. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions in a minute. I just wanted to ask uh, my own first um, view. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, if I'm understanding it right, what you're saying or posing through biosemiotics is if you see life through this lens that everything experiences their Umwelt and interacts with the Umwelt, you um, open this whole um, area of ideas. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned that it's not about anthropomorphizing animals. Yes. Um, so can you spell out to me, what's the difference in here? What's the difference when you're saying yeah. life okay. experiences uh, their own build and uh, what's, um, uh, okay. why is it not like putting a human I, I talked about a new way of seeing, okay, as a metaphor, perfectly comfortable. In, in the right context, it seems a useful word to use. But see here means see through the senses that we humans have. That's actually a very narrow perspective on all the possible ways. Um, if you look at the infrared, if you look at ultraviolet, um, there are colors that we don't see, but there are insects, there are birds, there are plants that live in that spectrum. The range that they have is much wider than ours, and we cannot understand what's going on in that world unless we're aware that the senses we have are a narrow window of observation onto this. 
Um, nice little example. I mean, there's obviously things like um, different plants uh, are particularly bright in the dawn and in the evening because certain colors come through more vividly. Uh, hopefully somebody else knows more about that than, than I do, but I came across a lovely example re recently, chili. Why is chili hot? Well, yeah, that's the chemical. Stop things eating. It's pain, right? To stop things eating it. Why is it in the interest of the plant to stop things eating it? Because so many other plants rely on their stuff being eaten in order to, for the seeds to. So why is it chosen that particular strategy? Um, you, you, seeds by yeah. you're, 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 you're so close. You're so close. It's because animals are put off by the heat of capsin, capucin, whatever, whatever it's called, but birds aren't. So this little plant wants to get its seeds spread as far as possible. You want to find a way of keeping the animals from eating it before it's ripe, that it fully ripen, change color. So the birds start to think, oh, this is what we're off. The birds will eat it. The birds are not put off by, by the heat and they will carry the seeds and deposit them. So you're spreading your seeds wider. You couldn't possibly understand that unless you knew that different creatures have different senses and different sensitivities that, that we have. And that's just another example I came across just in the last week or so. This is full of potential insights where you suddenly go, oh, I never, I just find this wonderfully rich as a new way of seeing things. Thank you. Anyone from the audience? I was attracted to the talk by the fact that you were going to talk about psychological trauma. I mean, you haven't yet. I haven't. The invitation is there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. How far back do we want to go? Um, I, I, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I work with, um, are working on a, a model called the triune brain which I believe we will find, yes, here it is, slide 38. There we go. Uh, Neo-Darwinism assumes no further evolution since then and assumes that the parts of the brain that we have and are using have a sort of developmental, what's the word, ontogenetic, phylogeny replaces, that the early parts of the brain uh, applied to um, mammals and, uh, for example, dinosaurs, Later, as we evolved, you got new parts of the brain, the mammalian brain on top of the reptilian side. The reptilian brain is the, the dinosaur, the lizard, the, uh, the, the um, something out of, uh, no, never mind. Um, the mammalian brain is, is kind of overlaid on top, like a layer cake. And on top of that, you get the neocortex, which is the bit that makes us human. Uh, but at any point, you can overstimulate the brain with uh, excessive um, neglect, abuse, aggression, or whatever. You can traumatize the individual, and that will kind of penetrate through and bring out these more mammalian or reptilian responses. In other words, that in response to trauma, we, in effect, regress through a number of different stages of human evolution until the people who are traumatized by life experience are, we don't use the phrase less than human, but they're, they're living on or they're working on the, the more basic fundamental fight flight kind of reactions that work for reptiles. Um, just another cheap jibe of this kind of thing. Notice as well that the picture of emotionality, the mammalian brain, is female, and the rational calculating brain that was supposed to make us human, is male. This is the, the sexism that's built into this is really quite outrageous when you when you start to see it. Um, I actually uh, have many many close colleagues who, on training courses, talking about trauma, psychological trauma, and so on, because my my field 
is psychologically informed environments for people who have been suffering neglect and abuse in childhood and trauma informed care is one of the new light shone shone on this which is incredibly useful in some ways and very very easily overstated and i'm afraid this this reptilian triune brain thesis was discredited about 30 years ago is not true that is not how the brain the human brain actually operates but it's still being taught as if it was true that idea that we biologically regress i see as being part of the sociobiology perspective on life where we believe biological explanations are more scientific because they're based in biology and biology is a science isn't it it's all about matter and material stuff these things to do with emotion and ideas and more social factors that could equally well explain why people behave in the way they do like distrust of authority figures because that's been their life experience and so you react in terms of your own personal history and what suffers meant to you suddenly we're into biosemiotics it gives a different perspective and i um does does that give you a bit of an answer at least yeah <laughs> um, by all means check check out i mean i, I was going to do a reading list with this give you the read um but look up current thinking on the triune brain and it's been discredited so many times but people want to believe biological explanations of why we are as we are because they let us off the hook otherwise if we started to recognize that social and economic and political circumstances that we have created that those are a large part of the explanation of why we behave in such maladaptive ways and those are things we can change but we would have to confront the social economic and political systems that are actually continuing to embed these ancient ways of working that we that blaming the biology is a very conservative point of view it's a right-wing point of view i would argue there's a lot of stuff about left-wing politics which we aren't going to get to well unless somebody <laughs> has to ask sorry then, then. No, no go ahead please so, so I can, you know, this, um, did it kind of bring something to bear's work around spiral dynamics where we're more talking about how life conditions might progress us into less complex ways of holding thinking so mm -hmm. as we start to change our life conditions we start to be able to hold and go through those stages and levels in our interaction with the world that we start to be able to hold more complex perspectives Is that kind of well my first reaction was it sounds like it i haven't i'm not sure who the claire is that you're talking about um, but like I say, I would love to talk to you more about it. I'd like to know what it is that you know about this stuff and what it means to you, because there's there's lots of stuff out here. There's lots of connections that I'm only beginning to to discover. So uh, my answer is probably, but I'm not saying that as the expert. I think you know more about this than I do. It, it sounds like you're onto something, but I just don't know know any more about it than you, what you just said. Thank you. Got any other questions or even perspectives? No. The um, semiotic bit, which you <laughs> stated over, I know. Um, I've done the semiotic, and it's obviously ah. French, French philosophers, and they're deliberately ah. obscure and difficult. Right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, but the site, you know, it, it's partly signs but it's a bit more complicated than that but um have you got any practical sort of examples where the semiotics comes into it as it, as it were well it's all about signs it's all about communication yeah. it's all about the messages we give off and receive it's all about the the physiology that life has evolved for each individual life form that allows us to receive and respond with some signs and some parts of the whole spectrum so it's taking that um i think maybe that's the reason why i didn't yeah, read well, much I mean, about I semiotics because i also I find it quite often 
calling it semiotics is very helpful actually i'd say semiotics is such a difficult concept anyway that, that, yeah. well maybe yeah. that's why the biosemioticians want to take it away from the french philosoph philosophers and uh, that that concept of decentering which i mentioned in terms of uh, kant and copernicus of something we can all actually understand and relate to decentering i believe is also used a lot in the french philosophy of the you know 70s 80s 90s and a lot of the people whose names you've heard of as radical thinkers and decentering is is one of their terms it's a hot topic and i don't know enough about it and i'm certainly not going to defend it but if anybody does know more about semiotics than, than i do i actually maybe it's time i learned Your theory about his works is around that similar to Descartes, around individuality. Where in this does his philosophy evolve? Oh yeah, okay. Um, again, I uh, I did a little bit of philosophy as part of my first degree fifty years ago. I've done a little bit of following it up since, but I do not claim to be a philosopher or to. Have, so I'll give you a a cartoon version of it. And if anybody knows more than me, if anybody out there on the Zoom call, etc., can come in and, and say, that. my understanding is Descartes, who was a mathematician and wanted to have mathematical type certainties about the rest of life. We now know that mathematics has an unreasonable effectiveness, one of these recent buzz, buzzwords, but Descartes wanted pure reason to be the foundation of his philosophy and and so on. Um, a little while later, David Hume comes along and has a critique of pure reason that says, actually, most of the things that we rely on in order to understand the world aren't based on reason, they're based on experience, and they've come from nowhere. They're just ideas like the, the causes of things, space and time. Those aren't things that we learn from, uh, from experience or from reason. There's just somehow there. Um, Kant comes along and then says, how do we reconcile these? And comes up with the idea that there are certain forms of thinking which are built into our nature and which we see the world through. So to that extent, he's accepting this is not empirical and it's rational only insofar as this is our world. Uh, that's much more kind of my, my way of saying it than his, but then his is, you think French philosophy is obscure and, <laughs> and difficult to read. Kant is notoriously obscure. But Kant comes up with the concept of the a priori, the before other experiences, before logic, before anything else, there are certain structures to human thought that are given, that are prior, they are there before anything else before reason before before thought what Utkill then says is well where did they come from then if you're thinking just in terms of human reason human experience human senses then you you're missing that bigger picture and we can start to see the things that we don't see we can start to examine and explore some of those those issues when we move outside of the human senses. Now, I would argue that actually we also use technology these days to, to go beyond our senses. We now know about infrared. We can have infrared and ultraviolet cameras. We can slow down and speed up the time world. So we can actually use technology now to move out of the original senses that evolution gave us to start to use much broader ways of interacting and observing the universe. So actually, we are not as limited by, by, by that, and the, uh, the march of science and technology allows us to go outside of the a priori. But what he was doing was, was looking at other animals, other creatures, to see how they experience things. And that's why he saw himself as taking Kant's a priori and as a subject to explore scientifically rather than as a philosophical better company. I hope that's more or less true. Um, yeah, I'm just interested in 
like how do you or what would you, how would you hope that if we're able to embrace like you know on a wider societal level this new or different view of the world how do you hope this would advance the work that you do right okay okay lovely oh good somebody at last last week about that that bit how are we doing for time um got six seven minutes okay we so we, we try and finish at seven but i'm not leaving i'm going to go and get myself a beer after this because i'm an alcoholic i'm doing during the talk but so i'd love to stay on and talk more with anybody who doesn't have to dash off um one of the schools of social theory um is called symbolic interactionism i think i did did mention it there which seems to me to be very much within the communication sciences that biosemiotics is talking about. The idea is that human society is made up of not necessarily stereotypical, but of perceptions of each other that we use to negotiate, to work our way to understand where we are, all are in life. And with complete strangers, we tend to see each other very much in broad brush stereotypes. Uh, social policy from government is made in terms of broad statements about this kind of person or that kind of child and a lot of um, demographics is based on categories that we believe to be truthful enough to to use to make policy to put funding etc this is all based on the words that we use to describe social groups or even to describe experiences and social processes um the biosemiotic view applied then in the social sciences seems to confirm the validity of the symbolic interactionist approach symbolic interactionism rises in the early parts of the 20th century and much of american sociology is based is based on that that way of thinking uh, the way we treat outsiders the way we see deviance deviant is itself in effect a socially constructed perspective on the way people behave what is and isn't allowed and so on so this perspective allows us i would say to explore symbolic interactionism as being one of the most useful ways to understand uh, that's like the two minute version of the answer i've got about another 17 slides um but just add to that then von Uxkill's claim that all these semiotic processes are interactive they're enlivened by the engagement of the creature whether it's a snail whether it's a virus whether it's a dinosaur or whatever it is the creatures interact with the world around them they are agents they are subjects they are making their own world not all of it but they are making what they can of what they what they've got and what they find they are contributing to their own experience what we find in social policy what we find in homelessness work what we find in psychiatry which is my, my field what we find in education is that the more we actually treat the people we're dealing with as creative individuals as people able to get involved and the more you involve them rather than just teaching at someone so they just absorb the knowledge rote learning the more people are involved in discovering in play the, that's a perspective which i think is not unusual but it's seen by the more hard-nosed types as being you know a bit a bit pious isn't it is it, isn't it just some kind of ideology actually you just want to teach people things they've got to learn them and they're going to... I would say that people who argue that we are as we are because our biology made us that way, the sociobiology argument, are missing what's, what really makes us human and what really creates human possibility, which is engagement, active engagement in the world, active engagement with each other to create forms of society that weren't on the savannah plains of africa that are our own doing and that we have we, i wouldn't say we're in charge but we're active subject creative agents so 
So it's a very empowering view, which you'll find now increasingly in a lot of social policy. I say social policy, but include education and there's a whole lot of other spheres of the, of the human social world that social policy happens to be, uh, social welfare happens to be mine. So I think this is actually a very uplifting idea to say, this is as biological, this is actually more biological than the view that the very early versions of Darwin and the very early versions of how in, of the value. Our, our DNA is absolutely brilliant. I don't want to say that the DNA is, is not useful. Look at the speed with which we identify the COVID virus by its DNA. Look at the speed with which we were able to then produce medications. And look at the god-awful mess that we then made, particularly in this country, of course, because we did not understand human communication. We didn't understand subcultures. We had no ways of relating to the way people actually make sense of their lives and what they hear from, from governments. We are so ignorant of social process that the, the difference between the extraordinary precision of me mechanistic science and our appalling ignorance of social process. And yet, if we don't survive as creatures on this planet, it won't be because we got Planck's constant wrong. It won't be because there was some kind of uh, tiny part, some aspect of um, Darwinian evolution that, that we misunderstood. It's because we didn't understand ourselves and we haven't put anything like as much time and effort as we need to, to understand what makes us tick and how we can make that work better. At this point, that seems to be a nice rhetorical ending. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. And that will be really perfect. Thank you. 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 And I do say again, don't take my word for any of that stuff. Look it up. Biosemiotics, Umwelt, you'll find a huge amount of stuff out there.